This is Monika Sawyer. Welcome to Real Estate Investing for Women, where we focus on all aspects of real estate investing, including strategies, mindset, emotional mastery, money smarts, and so much more to ensure your success. If you'd like to learn my personal favorite investing strategy, just go to blissfulinvestor.com. You can also listen to this episode on the Real Estate Investing for Women podcast on iTunes. Now, let's welcome our guest. Today, I am excited to welcome to our show our guest, Brett Schwartz. Brett is the founder of Capital Gains Tax Solutions. Each year, he equips hundreds of business and business professionals with the Deferred Sales Trust Tool to help their high net worth clients solve capital gains tax deferred limitations when selling their highly appreciated business or real estate. The Deferred Tax Trust offers an exit strategy that helps business owners escape feeling hostage to capital gains tax and venture capital to fund their next business deals by deferring capital gains tax and depreciation recapture of 30 to 50% of the gain on the sale of their businesses. That was a lot of really, really cool words. And yes, we are going to go into it. (laughs) Hey there, Brett. Welcome to the show. Monika, thanks for having me. Such a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm really, really excited. This is such a hot topic. So could you first just start by talking a little bit about your story? Tell us kind of where you came from. Absolutely. Uh, You know, many, many commercial real estate owners, they struggle with capital gains tax. And I actually started a company called Marcus and Millichap back in 2006, where we help people defer capital gains tax using a 1031 exchange. And so we were really focused on helping them create and preserve more wealth, in particular through multifamily was my specialty here in Northern California. And so we learned about the 1031 exchange on about day three. And 1031 exchange for your listeners, you've probably heard it before, is just a way to defer tax when you sell an investment real estate, as long as you buy a like kind investment real estate. But then something happened during what's, what's called the 2008 crash, where the marketplace really shifted and people got hurt quite a bit. So I had friends, family, and clients. Some, uh, many lost, uh, most, everyone lost something. Some lost everything, right? And they're all of their net worth because in particular, we found that they were forced to overpay for properties via a 1031 exchange and they felt trapped and they felt uh, pressured, you know, in this 180 day window to take on equal or greater debt for equal or greater property. And so we, I set out on a mission to basically say, how do we help all my friends, family, and clients and never have to face this again. And just at the right time, my manager brought in a gentleman to speak on this topic called a deferred sales trust. And so I sat in an office, probably a lot like a lot of your listeners are sitting somewhere listening to the first time saying, what is this? You're telling me you can defer capital gains taxes, not using a 1031, not have to go back into real estate immediately. You can do it for a business or a primary home. It's gotta be too good to be true. But I kept digging in, I kept learning, kept being open-minded to what it could be. And fast forward 10 years later, after countless deals of 1031 exchanges, Delaware Statutory Trust, Deferred Sales Trust, we're helping a lot of people escape feeling trapped from capital gains tax. And the best part about it is, never have to overpay for a property ever again via 1031 exchange. Oh, I love that. So why don't you tell us the difference between a 1031 exchange and the DST, which is what you used, right? Sure, yes. So so the premise is this. Most business owners or commercial real estate owners or high-end primary homeowners, they struggle with capital gains tax, somewhere between 30 and 50% of their gain when they go to sell their highly appreciated assets. So we use a deferred sales trust to replace the 1031 exchange to give liquidity, diversification, flexibility, and then the ability to go back into real estate at optimal timing. And that's really the premise here so that high net worth individuals can create and preserve more wealth. And optimal timing is the key here because because most of us know when it's a seller's market for real estate and when it's a buyer's market. Most would agree today, especially here in California and even most states, that prices are through the roof, they're ultra high, and it's hard to make sense of any deals right now with cap rates being so low, right? Interest rates being so low and rents having appreciated such a great deal over the last number of years. And so you coupled that with, okay, I'm going to sell high. That's great. But our parents taught us to sell high and buy low, not sell high and buy higher. 
right, which is not optimal. So the 1031 exchange, the first thing is you sell a piece of property, you need to buy something of equal or greater value, you need to identify potential properties within 45 days and then close within 180 days. And so we call that the sell high, buy higher 180 days later, which is not what you want to do. And so that's the first thing, right, is timing. Do you want to buy at optimal timing? Meaning you want to sell high and buy low. And that's the intention. How could I sell high now, sit on the sidelines, be debt free, and really kind of park until I see a deal. Well, so the intent is to have timing. The challenge is the 1031 doesn't allow you to have that timing. The solution is the deferred sales trust and that we can literally sell high now, sit on the sidelines, all tax deferred, out of debt, and you can wait for a deal. And that could be tomorrow, that could be day 181, that could be five years from now, okay? But the key is, when is it best timing for you when you find a deal? And I'll tell you about a quick deal story. We had a gentleman who did this in 2006, and he's one of the, um, the top deferred sales trust clients. He sold, and we called this the Monday morning quarterback. He dropped back and he threw the perfect pass at the perfect time. Sold at the peak, moved all of his funds to the deferred sales trust, and this is a large, large transaction and uh, he was able to defer all the tax. Five years later, that same property that he sold was foreclosed on by the buyer who, uh, by the bank who, for, for, by the buyer, the buyer was foreclosed on by the bank, and he bought that property back through his trust, all tax deferred, not using a 1031, at 60 cents on the dollar. We call that buying at optimal timing, right? Uh, sold high, bought low. And so that's the first thing about the 1031 exchange. It doesn't allow you to do that. The second thing about the 1031 exchange is it, it, it forces you to buy equal or greater value, which often means equal or greater debt. So let's say you sold a $10 million property, and you had $4 million of debt, well now you need to buy equal or greater value, 10 million or more, which most folks end up buying more. Now you're not only taking on that 4 million in debt, you're taking maybe on five or $6 million of debt. And again, you couple that with not buying at optimal time and you're putting yourself in a risky position. And too often we call that dumb debt, taking on too much debt for a property that doesn't make sense just because you wanna defer the tax. And that's where most people live in the commercial real estate world. They just buy and sell via 1031 exchanges and overpay or they get they get a bit smart and they buy and, and then they sell and pay the tax but we would say no there's a, there's a better solution it's the third one it's called the deferred sales trust put it into the trust get the best of both worlds um, the next thing to consider is what's called the depreciation schedules for any of your listeners who are listening and have owned for a long time especially 27 and a half years if you have multifamily or 39 years if it's commercial eventually you go to zero depreciation now depreciation is the number one reason or the top two reasons to own commercial real estate in my book because it offsets the in income that's coming in and the only thing that does this is business or commercial real estate therefore you pay less in taxes however if you own long enough, you eventually depreciate out. And if you've done multiple 1031 exchanges, you also depreciate out. Um, the depreciation schedule travels with the 1031 exchange, which is not good, right? You want more depreciation. You don't want the same schedule. So the intent is to get more depreciation. The problem is the 1031 exchange, it travels, so it doesn't give you more unless you buy a bigger, bigger property. Uh, the solution is the deferred sales trust. You can sell, move the funds into the deferred sales trust, and then use those funds kind of like kind of like a self-directed IRA to go purchase new real estate via a new LLC where you're the managing member of it and you're running that deal the same way you would be, except now you get a brand new depreciation schedule, which is really powerful for uh, creating and preserving more wealth. So my question is, does the property need to be in the trust when you sell it? I know that's a little bit technical, but you said that basically he sold the property and then he moved all that money into the trust. So give me a little bit more clarity on sort of what that cash flow looks like. Yeah, let's talk, well, let's walk through how this whole thing works. So that's probably what your listeners are thinking, right? How does this yeah. thing work? What is this trust? How's this all going down? Where's the money flowing? So Monica, we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to start with this premise first. Okay. It's the premise of what is actual receipt or constructive receipt. Okay. Now actual receipt for your listeners is just when you actually receive the cash. That's like, like if you get paid or you close a real estate deal or whatever, when you receive that cash, the IRS says you owe some tax on that. So this is the first concept. So Monica, if I, Monica, if I Come to you and I say, hey, I want to buy your $10 million apartment complex. Let's imagine you own it free and clear. 
It's a zero, zero basis. You've owned it for 27 and a half years. You're fully depreciated. But if you were to sell, you'd owe about 4 million in tax, about 40%. It's kind of a, a good number for the, with, with the depreciation recapture. So you're thinking about a tax deferral strategy. You're not sure about a 1031, but let's say you're considering a traditional seller carryback, which by the way, is this is the foundation of our structure. So if I give you, let's say a $2 million down payment and you carry a note for 8 million, how much actual receipt did you receive? 2 million. 2 million. Right. Yeah, you got it. The other amount is in a deferral state. You haven't received it yet, right? So you don't owe the tax on what you haven't received, okay? And so let's call it a traditional seller carryback. It's very well known. Your listeners probably know about it. If not, their CPA definitely does and their broker does. It goes back to the 1920s. Again, that's the foundation of our structure. But let's let's adjust that a little bit. Let's imagine I came to you with a zero down payment, okay? And I said, Monica, I'm gonna buy a property from you. I wanna give you a zero down payment. Hypothetically, let's just say you did that deal. In that scenario, if you took 100% financing and a zero down payment, how much tax is triggered today? Zero. Zero, you got it, right? Because you haven't mm -hmm. received any funds yet. It's in a deferral state. You've got mm -hmm. a carry back. Now, hypothetically, you could do a 100 year, 100 year carry, uh, carry back and, and just live off those interest payments for as long as you would want to. But typically in a traditional seller carry back, you would never, you would never do that deal for a couple of reasons. One, the buyer, you're, you're, you're putting a lot of faith in the buyer. Uh, you may have to foreclose. They can run your property into the ground. Most of those deals are structured at two to five years and therefore uh, they're paid back and the seller owes the tax anyway. So they don't decide to do that. And also all your eggs are in that one deal. Part of why you're selling your deals because you're trying to get away from that. But the law works, okay? So enter the deferred sales trust. This is the difference. We're gonna actually gonna find that cash buyer for 10 million. You know, he's going to come, a broker is going to find him. You're going to find him. You're going to be selling for 10 million. You're all ready to go. He's coming with the full amount of cash at close of escrow. But instead of doing directly to him and receiving that 10 million and therefore owing all of that tax, you decide you want to use the deferred sales trust. So guess what? The trust jumps in right in before close of escrow and it actually buys your position for the full 10 million, but it gives you a zero down payment. So you took a hundred percent financing. And then it turns around immediately and it sells it to this cash buyer for 10 million. So the 10 million goes into the trust. So this is where this is where the funds flow, like you, 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 your question. Now the funds are sitting in the trust. So follow this, Monica. If the trust bought it for $10 million and sold it for $10 billion, how much gain does the trust have? Zero. You got it. So the trust doesn't owe any tax. It just, it just bought and sold for the same price. No gain. Now, Monica, if you took a $10 million note, you carried back 100% financing. Remember, how much tax is triggered today? Zero. Yeah. Zero. You got it. So the smoke clears, the deal closes, the funds are sitting in the trust. Now, this is the best part about it. You're not in a 1031 exchange. So this is what the whole, the whole ocean, the whole blue ocean opens up to you rather than the red ocean. The red ocean is where all the sharks are at. It's where all the 1031 exchange deals is people chasing deals, overpaying for properties, feeling rushed and forced. And it's just a lot of blood in the water. Instead, all of a sudden you're in this blue ocean and this blue ocean is just wide open. What can you do? Well, you can invest it into stocks, bonds, mutual funds. Well, how long can, how long can the note go for? Well, as long as you want. We structure the notes as 10 year notes. At the end of 10 years, you can renew for 10, renew for 10, renew for 10. You can put it into investment real estate. You can put it into another business. You can do hard money lending. I mean, it's just this big, big blue ocean. Also, you're completely out of debt. In this scenario, um, if, you had a, if you had owed debt on that property, that debt would be paid off and just the difference would go into the trust. And that's, that's also powerful too, because a lot of clients, especially baby boomers, and this is a stat for maybe some of your listeners, according to the American Bankers Association, there's about $17 trillion that's passing from one generation to the next in the next 20 years. And this is known as the largest wealth transfer in the history of the planet that we know of. Okay. And in fact, there's about 10,000 baby boomers every single day turning 65 in the U.S. alone. And there's about 77 million in the U.S. alone. So every day these baby boomers are stuck in properties or stuck in businesses or ready to retire or have income needs or, or, or different challenges. And they're ready to get some solutions to this. And too often it's not to go buy another property. In fact, I just closed a deal in Sacramento for a gentleman named Peter. He's a baby boomer and he sold 18 units and he's been a real estate broker all of his life, had never heard of the deferred sales trust, had heard of a Delaware statutory trust. He heard of a he of course done 1031 exchanges, but had never heard of the deferred sales trust. And he goes, Brett, 
I felt I felt trapped before I met you because I had 18 problems. These are 18 units. He was driving every single every other day to Sacramento to bang on doors, to try to collect rents, to try to get evictions, to do all of this stuff. And he's looking to retire and he's going, Brett, I have 18 problems right now. I don't want a 1031 exchange and have 36 problems, right? I'd rather be out of debt. So he paid off all of his debt. He sold his building for about 1.8 million. He paid off about $500,000 of debt. He also said, Brett, I remember debt in 2008 before the crash. I had overpaid for properties and I almost lost everything. I held on, but it was very, very stressful. And I don't ever want to go through that again. So he goes, if I can get out of debt, that's a beautiful thing. If I can defer all my taxes, tax was about 550,000. That's a beautiful thing. And then I can just put it into conservative allocations. He goes, I'm not a big stock market guy. And, and he goes, but if I can put in conservative stuff and wait for the market to shift, he goes, that's exactly what I've been looking for. Where has this been all of my life? And I go, I know. I just learned about it 10 years ago. I've learned, I've done more and more deals now. And he's a since become and become a, a member with us. And he's out educating his clients too, because it works for the primary homes, which has mainly been his focus. But that being said, that's the power of the deferred sales trust. Any questions there? Cause I know I said a lot right there. Yeah, you did say a lot right there. That was amazing. <laughs> so um, when the money goes into the trust and you can sit on it, are you, do you have limitations on what you can invest that money in? Does it have to be real estate again or can it be other things? Right. So it can be stocks, bonds, mutual funds. It can be insurance products. It can be investment real estate of your own or with partners. It can be multiple syndications. Um, that's part of the beauty of the deferred sales trust, especially for me. We talked about diversification as a way to reduce risk, but too often with real estate, you're trading one asset and one location for another single asset and one other single location, oftentimes in the same product type and oftentimes in the same geographical location, because let's face it, if you're the owner of that property, that's what you know. You don't know anything else, right? But by definition, you're not diversified. So what can you do? Well, you can sell a multifamily property, right? That's highly appreciated, especially in California. And maybe there's some multifamily properties in other states with some proven track record operators who've been doing it for 10, 20, 30 years. And you can put a portion of that funds with them. You don't have to put all of it. So like in Peter's example, um, and another client right now, we're interviewing multiple syndicators. One is a senior housing syndicator. One of them is a multifamily. One of them is a mobile home park. And think about diversifying not only product types, but also geographical locations and also your dollar amount. And here's the cool part. None of the debt is in our clients' names if they don't want it to be, right? It can it could be in everyone else's name, right? So you get some diversification there. Now, let's say you say, you know what, but I actually just want to do it myself. Great, you can do that too. Um, up to 80% of the funds is the limitation. Let's imagine it was 10 million in the trust. 8 million can be used to form to, to go to go uh, purchase a new property or go into syndication deals. We call those alternative investments. The other 20% is going to stay in stock bonds, mutual funds. It's still earning interest. Most of our notes earn around 8% over any 10 year period of time um, and net cash flow around about 6.5% on cash flow to the client. Um, now they're going to pay ordinary income tax on that cash flow that's coming off the trust. But some of our clients will just say, look, I don't need any of the income. Let it compound and let me pull it at a different date, which is called the net income tax advantage, especially for our very wealthy clients who are, who are still pretty young and still have a big income over here. They can sell an asset and let the interest compound on top of it over here and keep all of that interest also deferred um, as, as well as the capital gains tax. So there's lots of nuances to, to this deferred sales trust. The key is creating a plan and getting connected with your trusted advisors with us so that we can all make sense of what's best for you. Mm, I love that. That was a lot of information. <laughs> I'm sure my ladies have questions for you. How, they, how can they get, get in touch with you to find out more? Yeah, so we have a YouTube channel. You know, you, you search Capital Gains Tax Solutions, YouTube, LinkedIn, as well as CapitalGainsTaxSolutions.com. And then we have our podcast, the Capital Gains Tax Solutions podcast. So basically, you just search Capital Gains Tax Solutions. And, and that's, that's really the key here. I'll mention as well, it works for businesses and private practices. We've done dentists, veterinarians, optometrists. We've done trucking companies, tech companies, you name it. We're also doing a Bitcoin case right now, too, which is really interesting because it's, it's subject to capital gains tax. So unlike a 1031 exchange, we can work with just about 
any asset type, which is really powerful. We also just did a house in Cupertino. We helped a, a, an individual who was selling a high-end primary home. And as your listeners may know, a primary home qualifies for what's called the 121 exclusion, where if you live there two of the last five years, you get that 250 if you're single, 500 if you're married. And that's a beautiful structure. I love that. I use that for myself and my family already, and it's it's wonderful. But above and beyond that, you owe capital gains tax, and you cannot do a 1031. And so we helped we helped her. She sold a $3.1 million house. She'd been there for over 20 years, just a couple of miles from Apple headquarters, and we helped her defer another $350,000 in tax. And what's neat about that, it's not just the external things that we're solving, but it's the internal things, right? I'm able to move from my house. I'm able to relocate, maybe live next to my grandkids. Now, now I have an income stream from an, an asset and I paid off all my debt and it's an income stream that's coming off diff, these different assets versus just sitting in a house that's, you know, the kids are gone and it's empty and it's, you know, when you feel real estate rich and cash flow poor. Well, we just, we've just escaped the capital gains tax, provided a whole new opportunity for income. And it, again, it works for, for, for the primary home. So I would just encourage your listeners to, to consider those different avenues too. Very interesting. Okay. Awesome. And you have a webinar, webinar that my listeners can watch to get a little bit more information, correct? Yes. Yeah, so you just go to my website and request free access to that and we'll send it to you as, as well as a free gift of the, um, the brochure, kind of an overview. It's like a five pager about escape feeling trapped by capital gains tax. That'll give you a great introduction to what we do and what we're about. Perfect. And that's going to be at capitalgainstaxsolutions.com. And I will have that in the show Correct. notes, ladies, so you can just look for it there. That was awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So are you ready for our three rapid fire questions? I am. Absolutely. Perfect. Okay. So um, Brett, tell us one super tip on getting started investing in real estate. Yeah, find a mentor and or join an amazing company um, who can train you. For um, for me, it was Marcus and Millichap. I had mentors, multiple mentors, and some of the best training on investment real estate. But it may not be you may not have to be brokerage for full time. There's ton, tons of conferences, tons of podcasts like Monica's podcast. Just dive in and not only consume the information, but then go apply it. So you absolutely have got to learn, but you've got to apply. If you do those two things and you look at it as a, as a long-term game, not just a sprint, you'll do just fine. I love that. <laughs> and then how would, what would you say is a strategy on being successful in real estate investing? Yeah. So once you've actually, you know, maybe you've established the basics out of a good understanding, it's investing yourself, right? So actually putting money uh, into deals, whether you're buying the deals yourself and or partnering, figuring out what your strengths are. So you might be good at raising money or you might be good at managing property. You might be good at finding deals or connecting networks with, with brokers, basically finding your niche within a team. Typically people aren't good at all five things, but they might be good at um, one or two. So for me and my strategy right now, I'm married with five kids and have two businesses. And so I actually don't own actively my own real estate by myself. I actually go with partners who are operators, senior housing, multifamily, retail, mixed use. And that's what they're doing every single day. They're the brain surgeons there. But I also raise money for those deals. And then I roll my, my fees into those deals, or I may find a deal and broker the deal and, and roll my fee into it. But the key is to take all of the wealth. And for me, it's, it's completely passive and that I just put it there and I get the check coming in, which is great. So defining what your strengths are and realize getting into real estate may mean one or two of those things. And it's typically not all five, figure out what your strengths are, what you most enjoy, and then figure out a way to connect with the team and add value to other people to help them achieve their goals as well. Nice. I love that. It's all about networking too, right? Is just finding those people yes. that can, that can fill the holes in your own, um, mm -hmm. sort of what, what's blissful for you, right? What are you good at instead of you having to learn every single piece along the way, which can be very unblissful. <laughs> Um, okay. 100%. We put it like this, hire the who or find the who instead of being in the how. And so you have a vision that you set. Okay. And too often we want to try to be the how, you know, we're, we're entrepreneurs, we're, we're, we're hard charging investors. We, we really want to, you know, figure this thing out and that's good to have that fire. But too often we get stuck in the how we do this circle of procrastination and frustration and to save a buck or to, or to figure it out rather than saying, here's my vision. 
let me just hire the who or team up with the who and I can achieve that so much faster and it's so much more enjoyable because now you're in your sweet spot, you're in your strengths, right? And you're focused on the highest and best use of your energy and your time um, versus again, just being the how and, and getting, getting frustrated or doing it too slow. Yeah, I love that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> and tell us one strategy that you would say you use every day that contributes to your personal success. I have to continue to remind myself to learn to work harder on myself than I do on my job. And this is a quote by Jim Rohn, um, R-O-H-N. And he says, if you work hard on your job, you'll make a living and there's nothing wrong with it. That's just, that's fine. But if you work harder on yourself, you'll make a fortune. Now, the first idea we think about is money, and that is a part of it, but that's just a small part of it. The real big value to this is who you become along the journey. So if I want to become a millionaire, if I want to invest in real estate, if I want to do all of these successful things, what is it going to make of me to become that person? And that's really the value to our family, our community, our country, our world, is the people we can become and the character we can grow and the legacy we can leave from that point on is working harder on yourself. So what does that mean? That's your health, that's your finances, that's your personal development, that's your leadership, that's your spiritual walk, that's, with, that's your relationship with your friends and your family, your intellectual goals. So, you know, five to seven, eight top major things, right? And learning to major on the majors instead of minoring on the, on, on, on the majors, right? So having those priorities, but again, it's a continual learning process because it's so easy to get caught up in the noise and the distractions and the things, even just the, the discussion we had before about working you know, focusing on our weaknesses or working on things that we're not naturally gifted at. You know, you're not all made to be, you know, brain surgeons or attorneys or, or tax people or real estate people or whatever your profession is. Figure out what your strength is, set your vision, and then work in your strengths to make that vision work by connecting with people, but also growing yourself and your character. Mm. So well said. Thank you so much for that. Brett, this has been truly amazing. I'm really looking forward to the extra portion of the show where we're going to be talking about mitigating estate taxes because a lot of us are fortunate enough to get um, get an estate or get, you know, be, be there to inherit, but then we worry about those taxes and, um, Brett's got an answer for us on that too. And I'm so excited to hear that. Yay. <laughs> so for those of you ladies who are subscribed to extra, stay tuned. Uh, we've got that coming. And if you're not subscribed to extra, but would like to be, it's really easy. This is what you do. You go to Real Estate Investing for Women Extra.com. And there you can subscribe. You get the first seven days for free so you can test it out. And uh, then you subscribe. And the ex once you're subscribed, the extra shows will come to the exact same device that you're listening to your normal podcast on. Um, so you don't have anything extra there. You just get extra content. Yay! So that's Real Estate Investing for Women Extra.com. For those of you who are leaving us now, thank you so much for joining Brett and I for this portion of the show. I look forward to seeing you next time. And until then, remember, goals without action are just dreams. So get out there, take action, and create the life your heart deeply desires. I'll see you next time. Bye. I hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to download my favorite investing strategy, just go to blissfulinvestor.com. See you next time.